Hello and bonjour from the French Riviera. Welcome to episode two of Future Boutique presented by Microsoft. I'm your host, Jeffrey Colon of Microsoft. We are here in Cannes, France for the 65th International Festival of Creativity, where we celebrate the top thinkers and doers in the creative marketing and advertising industries. I'm joined by my co-host, Steve Kearns of LinkedIn. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing well. This is an incredible, incredible festival. Um, and as my first time here, just getting to experience all of this, the networking, the creativity, the awards, the display of, of just you know, bravado in the marketing and advertising industry is, is really, really special. So in episode one, we wanted to touch on must-sees from Steve. What have you seen out there that's really exciting you? Absolutely. So two things. The first, uh, you know, earlier we mentioned this idea of the Palais. So the Palais is really the central nervous system of the Cannes Lions Film Festival. That's where the sessions happen. That's where the awards happen. But also that's where you have a whole display of all of the creative work that is actually up for a Lion Award. So that's everything from out of home. That is your digital activations. There's an AR and VR booth. It's really, really cool. Um, that's probably the most eloquent word I can use to describe it because it's just, it's completely awe-inspiring. So you walk downstairs and there's an entire floor dedicated specifically to this work. Um, and I kind of had to, to check myself a little bit and think about the fact that all of this work was created within the span of the last year. So uh, it's just amazing to think that all of this work you know, was activated upon in, in 365 days. And that really is only scratching the surface of what you can see. Um, and it's not even so much just the sheer volume of the work, but also you know, the content. So you obviously have your uh, brilliant campaigns intended to sell something, but you also have campaigns that are really you know, driving social change, making an impact. You, you know, I saw campaigns relevant to keeping our oceans clean. Um, you know, uh, the whole Me Too era, Black Lives Matter. It was, it was really, really neat to see, to see that the advertising industry is prioritizing that. Um, and as sort of a segue into, into my second point, it's this idea of, of the conversations that are happening at Cannes. So I attended a panel the other day actually on a yacht, which is a, a wild concept, but not so wild of a concept here in Cannes. That should set the stage. And we had, it was a whole panel about um, diversity inclusion, um, about female empowerment in the advertising industry. So the Association of National Advertisers actually has this initiative called Hashtag See Her. And it's all about how do we elevate women, um, women of color, um, people from different socioeconomic backgrounds into those leadership roles in advertising agencies, in, in brands, so that they can then design creative that's more inclusive and reflective of, of the audiences that we all serve. So it was really great to know that that is a priority that, that the industry is investing in because, you know, number one, it's long overdue, but number two, um, you know, very glad that it's here. Speaking of d and I, I got to sit down with one of the top names talking about diversity and inclusion. It's Danielle trevisano Holly, who's the chief creative officer at Possible. Let's take a look. We continue our coverage here on the Croset at Cannes Lions 2018, and I'm joined by Danielle trevisano Holly, chief creative officer at Possible. How are you today? I'm good, how could I be terrible in this environment? It's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. So I wanted you uh, to talk to you this week. You're one of the big interviews that I was really looking forward to because we're gonna talk about diversity and inclusion, DNI, huge thing talked a lot about in the advertising industry, the tech industry as well. Why is it important? Why should we be trying to break barriers in terms of getting more uh, people who don't look like me to actually be working in creative fields? I mean, the best ideas come from different points of view. So the more diverse your base of talent is and the more differences of opinion you have in a room, 
technically you're, I mean, it's a, it's better business sense because you're going to get to different ideas. And when you have a variety of ideas to choose from, you're ultimately in a better space. We're in the business of doing better ideas. And the more diverse your talent is, the more diverse your ideas are going to be. Now, the subject of pay, there's so much transparency now. You can almost look up what people are making at particular companies. Uh, there's things like Glassdoor. How do we... How do we sort of, sh you know, shrink those barriers so that we're actually, you know, making headway since the, the fact is women are getting paid a lot less to do the same jobs as, you know, male creatives? Sure. I mean, one of the greatest things I think has happened in New York and California is they can no longer ask... Uh, what, what you made before they're ultimately offering you a new job. I think, you know, the salary history factor is a big deal. So that we at least start from a level, level playing field instead of considering, you know, how much can I get this person for? We start to really think about what's market value for the role and then who's the best person for that job. Immediately that changes, I think, the conversation altogether. And I also think that companies, you know, Salesforce is doing a really great job of fixing their, their pay gap, but they're also constantly doing it. As they acquire more and more companies, they realize that it's a rolling system because the more companies you acquire, then you have the problem again. So I think knowing the data and actually allowing yourself the chance to go and find out do we have a pay gap issue? Um, what do we do about it? How much would it cost to fix it? How much time is it going to take to fix that? And ultimately being transparent with your employees and your potential candidates uh, along the way. Now you've been working on an amazing project, uh, this hashtag we counter hate. Uh, tell us a little bit about this. It's almost sad that we have to talk about this, you know, based on the context of what's happening in the world. But you know, why is this important? How do we get more of the creative community to think about doing things that, you know, really speak about uh, empathy and sort of trying to unite rather than divide? Yeah, I think creatives are natural problem solvers. That's what we're in the business of doing. And when I think we're in an environment right now where the world kind of needs problem solvers. And We Counter Hate was an idea that was born out of that, that feeling of uh, watching hate speech happen on Twitter and knowing that the world felt like they had no power to fix it. That freedom of speech ultimately outweighed the ability to just say this is wrong. So what we did was we figured out a way to ultimately manipulate the way the platform works, that every time a, a piece of hate speech was forwarded or retweeted as, as the platform denotes, um, that you would make a, an accidental donation ultimately to a group called Life After Hate. And it's done through AI and machine learning. And so what we did was we used the, the, the reformists at Life After Hate to help train the AI to spot the hate, because a lot of the times what, what's fascinating about hate, hate speech, especially on Twitter, is that there's covert ways of tweeting really, really horrible, nasty things that the average you know, creative director isn't going to know. So I think using the humans who understood how that behavior was going on in the space, plus the technology as a tool, right? Not as a toy, AI is not a toy, it's a tool, to ultimately um, do something on the platform that had never been done before was really an answer to this, this problem that people feel really um, like they have no power over. Now what's one thing that we can do to, you know, embrace DNI? You know, one action that you want to sort of speak to the audience about that we can take into the world and actually act upon? I think that we are started, we've, we've certainly come a long way with the conversation around gender. Um, the 3% conference, see it, be it, you know, time's up advertising. We're getting there in terms of the gender gap, and then we're starting to talk about how it's not just about gender, it's about diversity. But I think one of the missing audiences is people living with disabilities. And I know it's important to Santi and Nadella, it's important to organizations like Tommy Hilfiger, and we're starting to see that it's just, it's one in five Americans. It's bad business not to consider the fact that you're not speaking to an audience with buying power. I mean, it's not just a, a feel-good thing, it's actually smart business to think about not only gender, not only diversity, but people with disabilities as the whole package of diversity and inclusivity. Danielle, thanks for joining us here on Future Boutique today, here on the Croset. Thank you. Our live coverage of the Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity continues. Right here we have Jonathan Nelson, the CEO of Omnicom Digital. How's it going, Jonathan? 
Great, thanks for having me. Absolutely, so I would love to understand what is going on here for you at Can Lions. What are you seeing? What is most interesting to you? What, uh, you know, what's getting you up in the morning and having you super jazzed to, uh, to come out to the Crossette? Well, CAN for me is mostly a series of meetings. It's actually quite nice to be outdoors for, sure. for a moment. Much of it is spent just one meeting after another. Um, there are some very, very interesting things. Actually, one of the things that, I've, that is the most interesting is, you can't really see it, but it's right there. And it's a art exhibit by Snapchat. I love it. And uh, Christian Marclay, yeah. where it's, it's sort of a sound exhibit that takes Snapchat footage and composites it together. It's, a, it's actually a series of five art pieces which are absolutely brilliant and I'm not sure entirely why they're at Cannes but it's, it's awesome nevertheless. Yeah, so I guess that really brings up the question of why Cannes? Um, you know, why is it so important for individuals like you to, to make the trip out here every year? What is, what is that value add for, for an advertising leader? Well, can is sort of a combination of catching up with the industry. I mean, you, I've been doing this a long time, so I know a lot of people, and it's a good place where we all come together, catch up on things. We catch up very much with our media partners, our technology partners, try to lead our clients, show them the latest uh, technology, the latest work. And ultimately, this is a creative festival, and it's to show the work uh, and hopefully be recognized, recognize the great creative minds in our business. Absolutely, so the week is, uh, you know, we're about halfway through. What, uh, what's next for you? What, what are you most excited about for, for the remainder of the week? Well, my week, I mean, this is, doesn't sound extremely glamorous. It's <laughs> actually a series of a lot of meetings, yeah. just sort of back, back to back, punctuated usually by a dinner and then bed. So it's, uh, it's sort of more of the same for, what, five straight days. Yeah, well that's great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, very, very excited to, to have you with us. Sure. Thanks. Back at you here on Future Boutique, presented by Microsoft from our Breezy Terrace Studios overlooking the Crosette. And Jonathan Nelson, he's a pretty cool CEO, Steve. We actually mentioned the Snap Sound Stories, which are right uh, behind my left shoulder here, which is part of this larger digital beach activation. And we see Spotify, Facebook, Twitter, they're all here. What uh, have you been able to partake and participate in in terms of this ongoing trend, this emerging trend the past couple of years at Cannes, this digital beach property? Sure, so uh, you know, for context, up and down the cross set, which is this big street right behind us, there are a ton of, of brands that have essentially shown up and have built out the beach to create lounges, to create concert spaces, to create you know, everything under, literally under the sun, uh, which has been really cool to experience. So you know, I've been in the Sound Stories activation for Snapchat. You know, the social media companies are really, really showing up this year. Uh, you know, Facebook has a whole peer, Pinterest has a whole peer, um, and essentially, these are, um, you know, big advertisers. So it's it's sort of this this interesting relationship of, you know, entertaining these agencies, convincing them to, uh, you know, really pay attention to their platform. It's it's really cool that we get to be the beneficiary of some of this stuff. Um, Twitter Beach is huge. We've got um, a, one of the cool things is they're hosting talks on the beach, so you get to see. Uh, you know, creatives and and thought leaders. I, I stepped into a chat the other day uh, with Akon. Just randomly, you know, walked in and 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 there was Akon uh, talking about again diversity and inclusion, um, but also you know being an entrepreneur, being a musician. So it, it, this is the kind of caliber of talent that you have wandering around Cannes, and, and a lot of these brands are hosting these individuals. So it's a very 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 cool experience. I heard Akon was also talking about launching his own cryptocurrency. Yeah. That was something that came from this. Mm -hmm. uh, and these brands, it's almost like they're advertising to the advertisers. So uh, I guess that's why they build out these big cabanas, so to speak. Um, but the nerve center is still the Palais. Yes. And we heard that you actually went up and uh, took a tour of that. So let's take a look. We're here at the world-famous Palais, 
the home of the Cannes Lions International Festival of Creativity. Now inside this building, it's really the central nervous system of the entire operation here at Cannes. You have your sessions, you have your keynote speeches, you have your award ceremonies, and then you have a display of, of all of the work that's been nominated on the bottom floor as well. If you could move a light source fast enough, the rest of the world would still appear to be standing still. My name is Carlo van der Rohe. I'm a photographer. I grew up with photography as an access point to discovering a lot about the world. I built a dark room in my parents' basement at like 10 years old. We had some unusual cameras in our house and I'd walk around as a kid trying to navigate through the mirror image in that ground glass screen. When my son Aiko was born, I started thinking a lot about lineage and identity and specifically this idea of collecting passing moments and forming them and reforming them in the present to create our histories or our identities and stories. And I think photography with its, its unique relationship to time made it a rich space in which to process some of those thoughts. I founded Satellite Lab to create technology that didn't exist, but that I wanted to work with. Tool sets to play with ideas about perception and time. Imagine a place that could create the opportunity for technology like that to be built and built upon so that we can look at the world in new ways. What we built at Satellite Lab is basically a way to freeze a single moment of time, but be able to move light sources around within that frozen moment. It's something that we do completely in camera, meaning there's no computer graphics involved. It's like a, a software hardware solution that runs off of Windows. The idea with the interactive portraits was to capture each of the musicians in a moment of creating sound. I wanted to make images that were both a single sub-second moment, but that were changeable through being viewed, that had both of those timelines embedded in them. There's really two sides to the project here. One is the creation of the imagery, and the other is the way that they're experienced in the space. We use Microsoft Connect to track your position in front of the image, which changes the appearance of the portrait. So between the musician and the audience, you both become complicit in the creation of the image, and technology becomes the conduit. I think our visual literacy is changing as we spend more time encoding and decoding images. And I think that makes an interesting space in which to intervene in this bombardment of images and ask people to look again, or to think again about how they're used to seeing the world through photographs. Our continuing coverage here at Can Lions, uh, live on the Crescent, as you can see right behind us, here for Future Boutique, presented by Microsoft. I am joined by Abby Clausen, president of 360i. So happy to have you here. Thank you, I'm so happy to be here. And I may as well say I'm a alum of 360i, so I'm always fascinated by what the agency is doing. Fantastic, yeah, it's a great agency. I think one of the things that has set us apart over the years is every year we look a little different. So we, we're, we have a unique ability to sort of launch and scale capabilities as the market demands them. Now one of the differences that we've seen out there and where you've really made a lot of strides is in voice. In fact, I've downloaded this voice playbook that you have. It is incredible, it's sort of light years ahead of where I think a lot of the thought leadership is. Explain why you've done that and where you, you know, why you think that voice is so important for brands to pay attention to. Sure. Uh, the, the voice playbook was a massive undertaking. The reason we did it is that we really believe that voice is going to be a new interface for how people interact with their world. And that's both how they interact with brands, but also how they discover brands. So the playbook covers um, a wide range of, of sort of things you can do with voice. Everything from creating uh, skills and, and actions and apps and um, experiences that are voice enabled to uh, how are you making sure you're optimizing your existing content so that when the intelligent platforms 
the voice platforms are answering people's queries, your content are some of the things that they're serving up. That's interesting. It also sort of alludes or you know pivots to an area that's so big at Con or Can this year, which is you know artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, it was really sort of bubbling on the fringe last year, now really boiling over. Why is that such an important topic? Why are agencies talking so much about it? Why are brands trying to figure out and navigate this you know this this new sort of world that's emerging in front of us? Artificial intelligence has massive opportunity for the advertising industry, and it's not just um, with regard to media buying and targeting and advanced analytics, though that is clearly one area where AI is, is going to be um, transformational. It's also how are we taking giant swaths of data and um, making creating insights out of them, better understanding what consumers are doing when you have more census level data. Um, and, and because those data sets are so large, we need more um, AI to help us extract what's important. I think the other area where AI is super interesting is in creative experiences. And that's something that, you know, we're all here in Cannes because this is a festival of creativity. And so I'm, you know, really interested to see how AI plays into some of the, some of the pieces of work that are being honored this week. Now speaking of Can, have you had any opportunity to look at anything around us here to, you know, dissect it? What's mm -hmm. sort of interesting that you've seen uh, that you can allude to or have you not had a chance to sort of look at anything because we're, you know, we've been mired in client meetings, so to speak? One of the things I'm always surprised about when I come to Cannes is when I ask people about the work and have they gone and seen the work and so many people never actually make it into the Palais where all the work is shown and, and so I always try to make a point to get over there and to really spend some time not just admiring you know, the things that won the Grand Prix and the, the, the big prizes but also look at you know, the shortlists and what won golds and silvers and bronzes and try to extract you know, interesting lessons we can take back to our clients. Um, so I have I haven't made it over to the Palais yet, but I have time marked off on my calendar on Thursday to do that. And it's, you know, my, my personal piece of advice to anyone who's here is don't forget to seek out the work because that's why this festival started and it's still one of the most important things you can take away from it. That's awesome. Wise words from Abby Clausen, president of 360i. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks so much. That's going to do it for episode two of Future Boutique presented by Microsoft. Steve, what are you going to check out tonight? Yeah, so I'm actually going to head to a chat with uh, Kathleen Hall from Microsoft in Common, and they're going to talk about the intersection of Madison Avenue and Hollywood. So very much looking forward to that. Make sure you follow us on socials at Bing Ads, at Microsoft, LinkedIn Marketing Solutions. Uh, for episode three, make sure you definitely tune in. We have the wonderful John Bond. You're going to want to definitely check out that interview. And the mysterious and interesting Abigail Posner of Google. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>